Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ventura County Master Gardener Speaker Series. This will be the third in a series of virtual talks we have planned until we can resume our in-person meetings around the county. This presentation, Happy Houseplants, will be about an hour for time for questions, but we ask that everyone stay muted due to the number of people on the call. We have about 200 people signed up. If you have a question, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many as possible. Our speaker today is Olwen Kingery, a woman with an extraordinarily diverse background. He grew up in Newberry Park, became a professional horse trainer and a professional photographer, then a wife and mother of three boys. When she was ready for a career change, she studied landscape design at California State University Northridge, worked as a landscape designer, and branched off into her own design consulting business in 2006. After becoming a master gardener in 2013, she became a licensed landscape architect after graduating with honors from UCLA Extension Landscape Architecture Program. Among Olwen's ever expanding knowledge and topics are houseplants and shade plants. Today, we will hear how to keep the houseplants happy. And on October 15th, she will talk about plants that can also tolerate shade. Now, before we start, Master Gardener Nicole Vanoli will brief us about a disease that is threatening the entire citrus industry. Again, everyone, please stay muted and use the chat box for any questions. Nicole? Hi, everybody. Let me get my uh, slide up on the screen here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Asian citrus psyllid just for a minute, just to inform everybody what's happening with this. Um, most of us have, back, many of us have backyard citrus trees, and um, there's an insect called the Asian citrus psyllid that carries a disease called Wang Long Bing, or HLB. This disease, if your tree gets it, can kill the tree within three to five years. This um, disease is what decimated the crops in Florida, the citrus crops. And so we're, if we don't want that to happen here in California. Um, the insect and the disease are here in California, but we're trying to control it. The crops that we have are being sprayed, but it's the backyard trees that um, are a problem because homeowners don't always um, know what to look for. So. In this picture, if what you could do if you have citrus is check the flush on your trees, which is the new growth. If you see something that looks like this, and it'll be very minute, but this is the only um, nymph, which is like a baby of the uh, Asian citrus psyllid, which is right here, um, that has this little waxy protrusion. Um, so if you see something like this, it would be really good to get your trees sprayed. This is what the Asian citrus psyllid looks like. No other insect looks like this um, with the red eyes, but they are very hard to find because they fly. They, they don't really stay still. But this is what you might see if you have an infestation. Um, and this is what the tree may look like if, you, if it has the disease of Wang Long Bing. Um, the, the fruit is um, half green and half ripe, and the leaves may look like this. If it's a nutrient deficiency, the leaves will have this sort of yellow part on, on both sides. If it's Wang Long Bing, they may just have it on one side. Okay, so let me show you this slide. This is a map of where... Um, if you go to this website here, you could take a picture of it with your phone right now, if you want. 
and it'll give you more information about where this disease is. One thing you can do for your trees is um, control the ants because the ants like to farm this insect. Um, so you can control ants in your trees. That would be very helpful to keeping this disease under control. Also, don't move fruit from orange or any citrus tree actually, fruit or leaves anywhere besides your own household. Um, and also in terms of uh, other invasive pests, don't move firewood. Buy it, burn it where you buy it. And um, that's all I have. I have it's on to Alwyn. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to my crazy COVID office. Oh, yeah. We're remote, aren't we? <laughs> I'm so used to wearing that, I leave it on all the time. Anyway, so welcome to Happy Houseplants. Um, I'm Alwyn Kingery, as introduced, and I want to share with you some insider knowledge and common knowledge and things that uh, you might not know uh, just to help you with your houseplants. So I'm going to start uh, today with my PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to walk you through it. And then once we're done, uh, then I'll answer all those questions that are on the chat line, right? Um, and I want to answer them as we go. I just want to get through it and kind of keep the rhythm. Uh, so hold on one second and I'll share my screen with you. Hmm. Coming up, one minute. There we are. Happy houseplants. I'm a landscape architect and master gardener and equine specialist. I have lots of hats to wear. I would say I'm very, very proud of being a master gardener and I'll tell you why. Um, as a landscape architect, we kind of have a bad rap. We um, really focus on infrastructure. So walls and hardscapes and pools and all of those things that um, you know, make the backyard and the front yard constructed. Um, we only get two plant classes and two design classes for plants in our programs. So you can see where there might be a hole in our learning. Isn't that odd that you would not know enough about plants? So I felt that becoming a master gardener was going to fill those voids and I have found a wonderful place in Master Gardeners because I love to give back to the community and help them. And I do that now uh, by giving these little talks. Um, a lot of people don't have the inside information uh, that comes from the UC system, so we disseminate that to you. But I also give you some practical experience of what I've experienced in, in landscape and all of those types of um, realms that involve Master Gardener's life. So let's get started. I'm not just a pretty plant. I do so many things for you. I have benefits and there is a huge host of benefits. Here. Um, there's a lot of information on the web. You can uh, continue to investigate. Certain plants remove certain chemicals Allergies are reduced because those chemicals are out of the air. They also allow the dust to land on their leaves and not in your lungs. Um, it increases humidity. The transpiration of the water through the processes of it growing actually increases humidity in your home. Um, getting a restful sleep is important to all of us, I think. And the reason why the plants are so helpful is because they are producing more oxygen in your home. So you need that to feel more restful. Believe it or not, it helps concentration. There's a couple studies that were done and uh, students were in a room and when they had three plants within their room and they were working, they literally could concentrate better. Uh, emotional health, uh, we all need that, right? Uh, no matter what level you're at. Uh, it does help you because you feel in a more comfortable environment. It's not so constructed, it's soft, it's gentle. Uh, it's been proven to lighten your mood. Um, purify the air, we already talked about that. And it has a calming effect on people. 
it provides faster healing. Um, they have done other studies where when you send flowers to somebody in a hospital or indoor plants or, you know, of that nature, they actually heal faster. <laughs> you think it's just a feel good thing, but it really, really is a feel good thing. And then of course, stress relief. Very important. We're not so good at stress relief in the Western world. So bring some plants into your home and you could definitely benefit from a little less stress. These are the conditions of plant confinement. We push them behind bars of our house. Light, airflow, soil, water, fertilizer, all of these things here are extremely difficult to, to control. Um, but with knowledge, you can understand what you need for your plant. So this is the list we're really going to focus on. Um, and it's probably every one of these is just as important as the other. If you don't have one of these right, it doesn't matter what you're doing with the rest of it. So I want to go through uh, the light, all right, to start with. Ah, let there be light. The plants need light. If you have low light conditions, which is very common in most homes. A lot of us have long eaves on our houses. A lot of our houses don't face south, they face uh, north or east because we don't want all the heat you know, coming through our house. So very important to understand that uh, light in your home is one of the most important things to control where you put those plants. This little meter over here has probably been my best friend for years. Uh, this particular one has all types of sensors on it and they do fail over time. So you need to replace them each year. Um, one thing I want to caution you on is that this might be a ton of information and actually stop you from getting indoor plants. <laughs> and people get overwhelmed with all my information, but just take it step at a time, get a couple and then try to work through this uh, for yourself because it really is worth it. Um, the light sensor uh, is so important because understanding what light available, what light is available in your house is the key to which plants you can use. Um, I always encourage people to use grow bulbs or daylight LED bulbs right where their plants are. You don't have to do all of your lighting that way, but if you have dark spaces and you really want a particular plant, add a grow bulb. And if it's a daylight LED, it will supply the spectrum that they need to grow well. Uh, rotate your plants near windows or rotate in place. So be flexible. Um, you know, you see one just kind of not happy and it doesn't like it in that spot, switch them. Give them a week. And if you keep switching them, they will be very happy. Uh, open the shades and doors and windows, get the airflow coming in, but mostly getting that natural light to come across your room will help them tremendously. So this is a definition of light I got off of a website. Uh, I have at the end some resources so you can go to this website. And this is the best definition I found. Uh, direct light is strong light uh, and going through a window. So it's, it's not only intense coming through, but the glass intensifies the heat and the reflective properties of the light. Uh, this works great for cactus, succulents, outdoor plants. Um, I have a list of plants next to show you what works where. Uh, bright light is direct light, you know, the light that you see coming through your room. Bright light is just a adjacent to that light, just next to it, maybe just inside the window or up on a um, up on a shelf, but it's near the window. Medium light, this is a great description, that are about halfway across the distance between the window and the back wall. So this is the spot where you really want to be rotating plants because they're going to need that for their balance. Low light, seven feet or more from windows. I mean, I have some really dark spots and there are some plants that do well there. And then artificial light, that's the one I was talking about where you add a little bit of LED or you know, some full spectrum lighting. Uh, you can certainly help your plants out and, and you too. 
I mean, obviously a light room is, is less depressing than a dark room. It also helps with your eyes. So if you live in a dark environment, lighting it up will help your ability to see and support your eyes as well. So direct light plants, believe it or not, you can grow citrus right in front of your door, right? Or right in front of your window. If you have a nice big bank of windows, they will flourish there, but you do have to rotate them, right? And you can see that on the inside is shadowed and the outside is bright. So rotating will make a huge difference to these plants. Any outdoor plants will really do quite well. Uh, Hawaiian plants especially well because they don't like our harsh sun here in Southern California um, and they don't like our cold winters. So our house actually provides that type of tropical environment, especially if you have enough plants to create the humidity. Um, direct light can burn plants. So if you put the wrong type there, you will end up with burnt leaves. And it also dries plants out quicker. So those plants that are in direct light are gonna need a little bit more water typically than if they were in medium light areas. Are we doing good so far? Yes. I don't want to go too fast. Bright light plants. Uh, this is where you would find a lot of plants that flower. Um, they need the bright light to make that transition from leaf to flower. Um, typically, you could still use some outdoor plants here, um, but palms love this position. Again, bright light is just adjacent to the direct light, not any further than a foot or two away. Um, succulents actually do well here, although they get leggy. Uh, they're just looking for light. So if you see any plant that tends to grow long and octopus-like, put them in more light and they'll start to slow down. They'll bring their tentacles in. Uh, Croton Petra, that's what's here. This one has a lot of color to it. So this is where you can really pull in um, bright, happy material. Um, and palms obviously give you structure and height. And then these outdoor shade plants like uh, gardenia or azalea or, um, gosh, the list could go on what you could do there. Um, again, not up against that direct light, but just a couple feet away. Medium light plants. These tend to be non-flowering plants. Um, this taro is actually an outdoor plant as well, but it does super well inside. Uh, Kentia palms, which are those big, beautiful parlor palms, if you have a lot of room in your uh, atrium or your inside space, maybe two levels, that would be a very very nice plant to put there. Um, the other one is the ficus laurata. That might have been on the other list. Yeah, ficus laurata. This is an excellent plant. Very hardy, um, does very well in uh, bright and medium lights. Defenbachia, uh, another excellent plant, has very large leaves. Uh, the larger the leaf, a uh, little bit more tropical look that you're getting. Believe it or not, bird of paradise can grow inside. I, it's, it's kind of shocking, but it does tend to grow towards the light, but it's a very statuesque type uh, plant material to use. Um, and then this uh, philodendron species, as you know, is, is great indoors too. Uh, maybe you don't know about this one, Dracaena compacta. Um, I have a picture of that on my last slide. This is a, a great little plant. It's upright. It's uh, great for small spaces. It's a dark green uh, and it gets grafted into three different levels. You can find these at uh, any, any nursery. Uh, they're really terrific and they're easy to grow. Um, I like Dracaena compacta a lot and I use it a lot in design. Low light plants. Um, these are pretty common. You know, you see these plants a lot in houses, and a lot of it is because they're easy to take care of. Um, but the one thing to remember when you are pulling plants together is how they how they look over time. And light is one of those things. So you could take these low light plants 
and maybe you see they're not doing so well and just switch them or bring them into the medium light. You wouldn't ever want to put these in direct light, but you would want to bring them closer to the light. Um, you could take some of these plants and even put them on your porch entry if it's in shade and it's not during the cold parts of our, our environment, you know, of our weather. Um, and actually they could kind of regenerate out there. Um, the pothos is pretty common. They have a lot of species in pothos. You don't have to go with the standard green and yellow. They have ones with splash. They have ones with stripes. They have ones with uh, tiny leaves, big leaves. They're just, there's so much variety now that just don't count this one out just because we've been using it for 40 years. A lot of people like lucky bamboo, believe it or not, that's a very low light plant. Um, the only thing I can say is the water gets kind of grungy and you see a lot of salt buildup. So uh, that one just needs to be rinsed and taken care of a little bit more often than you would expect. Take a deep breath, right? Um, plants need to breathe. You can see this grouping of plants over here. Now, what light are they in? Well, they're not in direct light, but they're in bright light. However, you may be giving them good light, but they are crowded. They are in a corner. This airflow here would only work if this window was open a lot. So if you have conditions where you're layering plants, give them room to breathe. They need the airflow. Stale air causes plants to suffocate and proliferates disease and fungus. This is one of the main problems. Somebody says, well, I water it just right. I, I got it in sunlight or I got it near the window or whatever it is. And the thing is rotting from the bottom and that has to be airflow. Um, it also proliferates bugs, mealy bug is probably one of the worst deals and uh, scale, those two things. Um, mealy bug is almost nearly impossible to get rid of once you have it. Even putting it outside won't get rid of it. So you need to spray for them. Um, I do have a little trick for mealy bugs. It's called diatomaceous earth. Food grade, sprinkle them on them and guess what, they're gone and they're not gonna come back. That's an insider tip. Anyway, drafts are generally good for plants, so don't worry about drafts under the door or down the hallway or when some, a window's open. You want the drafts to come through the house. It's really great for them. Air conditioning and heaters dry the plants and soil out, so you have to water more often. The leaves dry out quicker. Um, it changes their microenvironment, so be paying attention to the direct relationship from your vents coming out of the house onto your plants. Uh, you might need to adjust for that. Breezes are especially beneficial because they replenish the air in the house, right? So you go from stale carbon dioxide air, open up the windows and you can get more oxygen and your plants will be happier. And so will you. Well rooted. So here we're talking about the soil. All plants need specific soils. They don't need all the um, fertilizer, but they need the micronutrients in the soil too. So heavily fertilized soils can also deplenish the micronutrients in the soil. So you want to know what plant needs what. Palms, like pumice, like a lot of airspace. Um, they do not like to soak in water. Um, Overwatering is pretty much the main killer because the soil can't breathe. It has to have, all soil has to have airspace. It cannot be saturated for very long. Are there plants that can be drowned a bit? Yes, there are a few. Um, however, most house plants can't because their conditions are so confined, they can't recover. Uh, salt buildup is a huge problem with plant material inside. Um, a lot of times the, the soil is so saturated with our, um, our water from our uh, faucets that the salt buildup starts to kill the plant too. So the salt is in the water, but it stays in the soil and kills the plant. 
uh, soil plants, obviously. And then pottery, choosing plastic, terracotta, ceramic, all of these uh, will either facilitate the, the soil from having trouble or not. I find that terracotta actually proliferates fungus. Um, the water tends to absorb into the terracotta and then it holds that water and then the fungus grows. So in order to use terracotta inside, you need to have a good um, water barrier uh, painted on the inside. Ceramic and plastic are great, but plastic tends to dry out the soil faster. Um, and it heats up if it's in direct sun more so than the ceramic does. A plastic's not ideal, but it's certainly useful. Gravel, pumice, and vermiculite, all of those are great additives to your soil to keep those spaces, those air spaces. But what happens when you put mar I'm sorry, moss, bark, and pebbles on top? You hold more moisture. Um, it looks better, it's cleaner, but you won't want to water that soil as much because you have these items on the top of the soil. Uh, moss and bark uh, tend to increase disease up against the stems of the plant. So you don't want to embark haha, on too much bark and moss around your plants, at, le at least where the stems are. Water, water, water. This is one of the biggest issues everybody has because we forget to water our plants and then a month goes by and their roots are dry and we water them and we basically just kill them off because they can't absorb all the water we just gave them. So it needs to be consistently watered. Um, some plants like once a month, some plants like twice a month, but that moisture meter is your best friend. <laughs> um, you want to see how your watering program works for those plants um, by testing them regularly before you water. Basic knowledge is that plants don't want to suffocate. They need to have consistent water, but water that drains. A lot of people ask me about this one, uh, water source. So faucet is the worst. Ice is better because it's slow. Bottled water is excellent, believe it or not, because it has no salt. And rain is absolutely 100% the best. So should you put your plants outside in the rain? Absolutely, if you can, but then you'll forget and the clouds go away and they all get fried. <laughs> so what's the best way to handle that? Just collect the water outside, you know, in a barrel of some sort and use that water for a while for your plants. They will thrive and thank you. Bottled water is great because it's readily available, but it costs money. Um, I've seen within 30 days of giving a plant bottled water, how much happier it is because the salts are gone. You can also flush your soil out of your, uh, I'm sorry, flush the salt out of your soil so that it will remove all salts or take the top part of the soil because that's kind of where the salts congregate, take that part of the top of the soil and remove it. Uh, trays, inside or out? Well, um, this is a tough one because if the trays are inside your, your, um, your container, like let's say you have a basket or a, uh, a pot and you've got the tray inside holding water, that's great because you don't see it, but guess what? You don't see it. So a lot of times what happens is there's water sitting at the bottom of those trays all the time. And so you're just drowning the roots. So you need to have enough, at least enough room to see in and make sure those trays aren't full of water. And you'd be surprised at how little water the plants use and how much sits around. Uh, gravel tends to help, help with plants that need moisture. Um, gravel at the base of those trays uh, is very helpful. Every plant has different water needs. Um, I'm sure you know by knowing the outdoor stuff, like the succulents and things like that. Um, believe it or not, palms want water, but they don't want to sit in water. So you have to water them frequently, but remove the water just as frequently. 
How are we doing on time? Are we about halfway? Yes? Okay. Oh my gosh, they like food. Just like your it. Feed me, feed me, feed me. So typically in a commercial setting where you buy your plants, those plants are getting fed every two weeks. And so you bring them home and, you know, after a month, you're like, well, what's wrong? It was so pretty. What happened? Well, you're not feeding them every two weeks. They're hungry. They're used to that. So make sure that you are finding a way to feed them at least once a month, hopefully every two weeks. Uh, these are a few of my favorite items. The, these houseplant steaks are fabulous because they're time release. You put them in, you don't worry about them. It takes, uh, you know, it varies on how much water you're using, but they give a time release and it's just so easy. You don't even have to think about it. Um, you have fertilizers for specific indoor species like this one. You have violets, indoor cactus, orchid. Uh, well, obviously you have insect, but these are all organic and natural, which, you know, it's up to you whether you use commercial or organic. Um, that's your choice. I'm not going to tell you what's best or not, but that's up to you. So this one is really important, and I'm going to stay here for a while. Um, and it, because a lot of people are curious about design and how to put these things together and um, so on and so forth, um, I wanted to stay here for a while, about the last 20 minutes or so. So when you're, you have your house and you have this, this nice space and you want to add your plants, um, you have to think about the value of those plants and what they're going to provide to that design. If you just want to put plants in, just put plants in, but this is kind of how I approach it. Um, I want it to be an interesting plant. Um, I want it to have scale and balance that helps the rest of my room. Um, I love Kentia plants, but I have short ceilings. I can't have them. Um, like I said, that, that uh, Dracaena compacta is one of my best plants because I have these smaller spaces. But So when you're designing for interest, um, you're designing in a way that complements the space. Interest might be a particular showy plant that can draw your eye over to the back window of your home or um, something that might balance out large furniture um, where you might have a big, well nowadays we just have the, the TVs on the wall, right? So you have a lot of blank space. Uh, blank space is nice but kind of boring. You get tired of it after a while, you're like, oh, it's so clean, and I don't have to do anything. But then after a while, you're like, man, you know, this is kind of lifeless. So thinking about scale and how to balance out those elements in your house um, really are very helpful to your environment. And balance, so scale, so large items, large plants, or you have a lot of large items, maybe you just need small plants. So kind of think about how your room wants to be balanced. Um, and now that we're in crazy COVID land, you have lots of time to think about that probably, right? <laughs> um, using various objects for your pots. Uh, you can see in this photo here, I actually have a bean pot. Um, that plant below, I have a um, basket. I didn't show the basket. And in the back, I have this little, you know, little vase on behind. And I like this scene. And you can see the filtered light on the plants. This little plant is my favorite plant in the whole wide world. This is called the love plant. It's a, a succulent type plant. I haven't watered this thing in a month and a half. And look how happy it is. Yes, it's a little octopus-like, but I don't mind. I kind of like it um, trailing over. If I wanted it to do less of that, I would put it more in direct light, but this is indirect through a nice shears here. Down below, um, this Deffenbachia. So now I want to talk about uh, layered plants, right? So this is creating a layer of plant material. I don't just have one up here. Although single plants is a really nice look if you like simplicity and you have more of a modern style home, single plants are really fantastic for that. I happen to have more of a traditional Mediterranean home 
and I like the layering. This is Defenbachia down here, green splash. Um, I haven't watered this plant in a month, and it's as happy as pie. <laughs> is pie happy? No, it's happy as a kid with pie. Um, the layering here works for me because I have small leaf trailing, large leaf upright. They kind of connect too. I like them touching each other and sharing the love here. Um, so think about layering plants. You can also layer plants within the pot. So I can put this little love plant inside the Defenbachia and that would work as well. However, remember what I said about airspace, they might compete for the air and then they would both snuff each other out. So be very aware of how you're layering your plants. Uh, use of outdoor plants, which is really fun to do. You could um, take your azalea that's in a pot outside, bring it inside while it's flowering, if you have some direct light. I mean, be creative. You don't have to go out and buy $50 plants, fill your room, it's gonna cost you 600 bucks. You can make some rotations inside and outside. Um, other outdoor plants that do well, those peace lilies are fantastic. I know they're kind of common, but they're pretty showy when they're flowering. So if they're outside and they're flowering, bring them in. Another way to bring in interest is just to use cuttings, right? You can, you can do this pot with a bunch of cuttings. You could do um, some dry stuff with live stuff and just use it as a backdrop to a plant that you have all the time. The cuttings are great because then you can take those cuttings, uh, sprout them and, and start growing them in the house and realize, hey, this really works with my concept. I'm gonna keep the cuttings here. Um, and using objects, right? Um, I like to put stuff in here like a little bunny rabbit or <laughs> just goofy things like through the holidays, I'll put a little snowman in here. Um, it's really fun to just look at your plants as part of your overall design in your house. Um, I think that's about it for inside. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about was also doing wall pockets on your wall inside your house. A lot of people do them outside. There's no reason why you can't do some neat wall pockets inside your house as long as it's contained and you're not dripping water. Um, that would be really a, a, fun, a fun thing to do. And so that's pretty much my talk. Um, just want to let you know to have ha happy house planting. And you can see I have indoor plants outside with my turtles and my very, very easy keeper horse. Hmm. <laughs> if you have any questions, that's uh, the time is to answer them is now. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. Alwyn, I'll just go ahead and um, read them. First of all, somebody was wanting to know if you could go back to the slide that was before the um, the plants that need a lot of light. Sure, absolutely. The definition? This one? I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it must be. So hopefully that person, yeah, so it would be that one. So they hopefully want to that person that asked the question could take a picture of that with their phone. Great. Great. Have it. Okay. okay. Here's some other questions. Um, can you use filtered tap water? Is it better than direct tap water? Yes, it is. Um, filtered as long as it's not soft water. Soft water is the worst water to use for plants because they put salt in it. Yes. So if you're using filtered water from your fridge, uh, just make sure it's not freezing cold you know, set it out for a while. But yes, it definitely, it'll filter out a lot of contaminants that your plants don't need to deal with. Okay. Have you ever used worm tea as fertilizer or foliar spray for indoor plants? Definitely, especially when I was doing commercial plants. Um, the, the foliar um, a fertilizer, you know, it's like their skin. So it just absorbs right into the plant and it, it doesn't take time to go from root up to leaf. So if I see a plant that's, you know, going to start struggling, then I would use the foliar sprays. 
Um, I do use a lot of outdoor organics. Um, I have a process here. Um, it's a little odd, but I have a duck pond and in my duck pond, I have a valve and I rinse it out and then I collect all my duck stuff. And I actually use that once it's dry in my plants, indoor and outdoor. So yes, you can use outdoor fertilizers. You do have to know what types of fertilizers your plants like. So a flowering plant likes a different type of fertilizer than a green plant. Okay. Um, can you say some things about light needs for African violets? Yes, uh, African violets are an indirect or bright light plant. Um, they like a north facing or east facing window. Uh, west facing will fry them and south facing of course will obliterate them. So um, you can pull them in from the window but north facing really is really lovely light for the violets. I like the east better because then they get a little bit of sun without burning them. It's not hot sun. So east facing would be best uh, exposure. Okay. Um, if tap water sits for 24 hours, will the salts come out? Hmm. No, not typically. Um, they might settle a little bit to the bottom, but it's such a fine, fine particle by that time, I don't believe that that will, that will occur. Um, okay. I don't know exactly though, so that might be something else to look up. Okay, um, my gardenia is in an eight inch vase that was sent for my birthday, but not flowering. What should I do? to care for this as it is my favorite. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, gardenias are very fussy. Mm -hmm. Number one, very fussy. They actually like bright light, bright light. They wanna be in morning sun, they do. Um, if you want them to flower, you need to move them to direct light, but not direct afternoon light, they will burn. So east window. Um, mm -hmm and rotate them outside. Bring them outside when they're not flowering, bring it in when it is so that you can get the benefit inside the house. Gardenias hate their feet wet. You cannot let it sit in water. If you plant it outside, it needs to be planted high with a lot of peat moss and a lot of loam. Um, if you have it inside, um, you need to make sure the tray doesn't have a lot of water in it. The hard part is, is that gardenias like a lot of water. So, you would need to water that probably every two weeks. And if it's hot in your house, you have a lot of heat going, maybe even every week. Does that help, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. Um, okay, next question. Um, someone gave me a split leaf philodendron and soon the new growth looked yellowish and thin. What mm. to do? Hmm. Well, yellowish and thin probably means lack of light. The philodendrons are very, very hardy, almost succulent-like in their leaves and their stems. So you could overwater it, it could be overwatering, but I would bring it into more light. Um, maybe we can ask back, what type of lighting is it in right now? Philodendrons will grow in direct sunlight. They have to be hardened off. Oh, that was another thing I wanted to add to that gardenia question. If you're going to move it from inside to outside, you need to do it transitionally out. Otherwise, it'll fry. It needs time to adjust to the light and the um, chlorophyll exchange. Same with the philodendron. Um, I think the philodendron probably needs more light. That would be my first guess. Second would be maybe it's got too much water. Okay. Next question. If I have a plant that is growing well in water, how do I transplant it? What about using compost for indoor plants? Oh wait, let's let's do this is a multi question. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the plant that's growing in water and how to transplant. Hmm. So when it's growing in water, the roots are elongated, right? Um, they're not rolled up in a bunch usually. So ideally, when you plant those, 
and transfer it to a pot, you need to use moist soil and create a type of funnel for those roots. So you're not sitting them on top, you're not smashing them either. Um, look at the length of those roots and let's say they're eight inches or 10 inches or 12 inches. You need your pot to be at least that depth, that depth plus another two or four inches, just so that the roots have the best environment to start in. Um, and that will stop them from uh, circling too fast. Um, so if the soil is moist, then it'll be able to stay up on the sides. Another way to do it is to do it in layers. So you put a small layer down below, have someone hold the plant in place, and the next person kind of sprinkles in the soil as you hold the plant. So those are the two options to do that. Okay. And can you use compost for indoor plants? Hmm. Okay, let's talk about compost. <laughs> um, the compost you get commercially has a lot of sticks in it. It is extremely difficult to find compost that is composted. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't really recommend commercial composts. Um, because of that reason. Um, and master gardeners all know that it robs nitrogen. So what's the point of composting if you're gonna pull out the nutrients that it needs? So um, a better thing to add is worm castings, bat guano, um, and steer manure. Haha, oh, just kidding, not steer manure. It's really, really smelly. <laughs> but um, well composted insect or bat, um, species is really the best because it's extremely well composted. Um, I have rabbits and over time I get great compost from them because it is completely broken down. So it just depends on what you have available. Okay. And um, can you speak to ginger roots that are sprouting? Hmm. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Does that mean like the edible ginger sprouting or a decorative ginger sprouting? And are we talking about the young pups that are coming off the ginger? Um, Hopefully so this person, Donna, will fill in those questions okay. at the end because she okay. didn't say anything about it right now. Great. Okay, well, let's, okay. See, yeah, let's wait on that because I'm not sure okay. what she's saying. So. Somebody's asking about wood containers. Are they mm. good? Um, well, yes and no. Uh, if you're using them inside, um, obviously they're gonna ex they're going to accept moisture from your water and can stain things. Um, but if they're well treated, then yes, they'd be fine. Um, I find that wood, especially in a low light and a low air space, tends to grow fungus, uh, same as terracotta does inside. So if they're, if they're heavily lacquered, then yes. Um, or if you have a good liner on the inside, then yes. Okay. Um, next question. Are some plants like Diffenbachia dangerous for pets and babies or babies if ingested? Uh, yes, Diffenbachia is definitely toxic. Um, I have um, on the last page the resources. Um, oh, I didn't put the, I had the ASPS, uh, must have did a different one, but the ASPCA lists a wonderful comprehensive list of plants that are toxic to animals. And I mean, my little dog has eaten the Defabachia a little bit, but do you know the most toxic plant in my house? It's my stinking boxwood out front. I have never had an animal eat my boxwood. My dog actually went catatonic three times before I realized he was eating my boxwood. I mean, how many people have boxwood? Lots and lots of people. I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't even, it wasn't even on my radar. Here I'm worried about the Defenbachian. It's actually the stinking um, boxwood. Sorry for that noise over there. <laughs> okay, so a couple of people want to know what the name of the, the draping plant that you had that, that you were showing on the layering. 
Slide. Yes, that was the love plant. Um, I don't have the scientific name, but it's called I'll look the it up. plant. Yeah, would you? Thank you. <laughs> it's a new plant to me, and it's just lovely. Um, there was a, there was a, on the ginger, it was edible ginger. Oh, edible ginger. Yeah. Okay. Um, so sprouts on the edible ginger. If you want to continue and proliferate your ginger, they do grow by rhizomes. So you can, you can break those sections and transplant the sprouting section. And you would want to do it with a very clean, sharp knife. Uh, if you want to plant it. Uh, go ahead and plant it. It actually is quite a lovely plant. Great. I cannot find the scientific name because a lot oh. of other plants are coming up that are that are called love plant. My that fault. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I find is um, it could be Hoya Kerry, K E R R I I, heart live plant. It kind of looks like a a heart. Yeah, no, not that one. Okay. Or, hmm. Can't find it. All right. Yeah. I would take a uh, picture of that slide and go to a nursery and look. That's what I would do if, yeah. if somebody wants to buy that plant. Yeah. Take a picture of the pic, you know, maybe you could put that slide up again and people could take sure. a picture. Sure, I'm sorry I don't have that name. I didn't think anybody else would like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that plant. That one, yeah. Yeah. So the next question we have is well water bad for plants? Hmm. Yes, typically well water has a lot of sediment and a lot of salt. It just depends on the area that you're at. Um, typically when you're using well water in your home, you're filtering it though. So I'm assuming that your well water is filtered uh, to your house. If it's just outdoor well water, uh, it could be high in all kinds of things, even um, cyanide, believe it or not. So it would be ideal to test your well water if it hasn't been tested. Um, it will do okay because mostly the Plants in your garden will do okay because they kind of have natural filters, but not your house plants. They don't have natural filters. So um, I would say well water is questionable for indoor plants. Okay. Is light from north or east side considered bright light? Uh, east light would be considered bright light in the morning if you have um, east facing windows. North would be considered probably more like medium to bright, depending on your eaves, how long they are. Um, so it just, it just depends on the conditions outside and what makes it bright or medium light. Okay. Is it safe to use the water collected from my dehumidifier? Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. It's it's just usually uh, distilled water you would put in those, correct? You wouldn't use tap water. Um, therefore, it doesn't have all kinds of salts and sediments in it. So yes, it would it would be usable. Okay. <coughs> Great question. Next, next question. My Calathea medallion leaves have crispy edges, turned lighter color, and all the leaves on the bottom are dried up. It's not happy. How can I save it? We water it once a week. It's been in partial shade for a month um, because we thought it was getting fried from too much light. Mm -hmm. Can you feed it more? Uh, have you been feeding it? And possibly, you said the tips are brown? Yes, yeah, so right? it has the crispy edges. That could be salt. Yeah. That could be salt. So, so flush it, right? Flush your plant um, and feed it. Flush and feed is where I would start. 
Okay. It should light good light. Um, unless you're getting direct light, it should be in that bright to medium light. Okay. Another question which all of us deal with and hate, uh, fungus gnats. How do we deal with fungus gnats? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, they're laying in the soil. They're laying their eggs in the soil and they're growing from that. So um, the best thing for you to do is to let your plants dry out completely before watering again. Um, they also thrive in low air space areas, meaning lack of air and air flow. Um, so move them to an area where it's um, got more drafty um, conditions, um, but really the, uh, the watering is the key. And yep. also you will have to spray it with a little insecticidal soap just on top of the soil. And that will, that will really start a good process for you. Okay, we have, we have 40 more questions. So are you okay answering? I'm fine, keep going. <laughs> okay. Do you replace or rebuild the soil of indoor plants? Yeah. The only time I do that is if it was sitting for too long and I made the mistake of drowning them because then the soil starts to rot. And as it's composting, it will pull all the nitrogen and it also causes the roots to rot. So then I would go in and trim the roots. And I also tend to use the top, t tend to remove the top of the soil as well because of the salt buildup. But I don't typically replace the whole amount of soil if I don't have to. Um, what happens though is that the nutrients are removed as the plant grows, so feeding it is what's more important. Okay, one of my house plants just keeps giving brown leaves. I have tried everything, changing location, bottled water. Do you have any suggestions? It just keeps getting leggier. Ah, key, leggier. It needs more light more often. They're leggy because they're reaching for light. So I'll start right there. Um, and if it stays brown, that is also a condition of low light. So um, what plant is it? What is the variety that you have would be my question back. Okay. Next question. Have you tried any DYI natural fertilizers? Um, mm -hmm. I think you, I think you talked about that, yeah. but they're, they're <laughs> <A> chicken rabbit. <laughs> yeah. They're That's asking specifically about aloe vera blended with water. As a fertilizer? Mm -hmm. hmm. That's a new one on me. I think okay. I'll try it. <laughs> aloe has great properties. It does. Aloe has amazing properties. Um, it's a, a incredible healer. Um, I use aloe for myself, for my animals, for all, all kinds of stuff. I drink it, I eat it, I, blah, I love it. <laughs> um, I don't know its benefits for the plants. Okay. So I maybe would stay away from that or, pra or practice on a plant you don't love? <laughs> oh my gosh, I would definitely um, uh, practice and experiment. I think that's a fun thing to do. Okay. I uh, would love your expert advice on taking care of a maiden hair fern. <clears throat> Boy, they're tough. They like a lot of food. Maiden hairs like food. Uh, they're very, very, very needy that way. Um, and they like high light. Uh, a lot of people put maiden hairs in uh, dark spaces and immediately within a couple weeks, you start losing all the leaves. So um, bright light, not direct, they'll burn because they're very thin. And also keep in mind that because they're very thin leaves that they use water very quickly. So um, keeping it watered, keeping it fed and giving it high light is what's gonna help those. Also um, rotating those. Um, you'll notice that very quickly they lose their underside leaves because they don't have balanced light around them. Uh, they would also benefit from light bulbs, you know, LED um, full spectrum bulbs if you can't move it any closer to light. Okay, and then here's a question about a ZZ plant. Oh, I love ZZ. <laughs> They're I great. know. They're great um, plants. 
are they okay inside a bedroom in a low light condition? Yes, they are. But um, the mistake people make with ZZ plants is they think because they're very lush looking, they think they like a lot of water, but they are a succulent. Um, they do not need a lot of water. If you're in a low light condition in a bedroom, you might water those once a month at the most. Okay. Um, and don't let them sit in water. So yeah, they should do fine. I have um, three really great ZZ plants in my office that's really low light and they just thrive, but you can drown them very quickly. They okay. rot very fast. Okay, what is your best advice for taking care of prayer plants? Hmm. Um, those also need a lot of food. So fertilize, maybe those job sticks would really help that plant. Um, they like to eat. <laughs> they like hungry little fat children. <laughs> but that's, that's what I can offer for the prayer plant. That's what they need the most. Um, okay. And again, like with every other plant, careful with your uh, moisture content. Use the moisture meter. It's just a little finicky. Okay. How should you handle pots without drainage? Should you put rocks at the bottom or leave pots uh, yeah, in the plastic nursery? Plants. Yeah, a lot of indoor plants don't have drainage. Uh, that is a tough uh, condition. Um, I would say this, the best way to handle it is after you water your plant, lift the plant up and see how much water is there. And you might be surprised that there's a lot of water there. Uh, gravel does help um, allow for water to get below um, the plant pot. So you can keep it from drowning. Um, but then the water just sits there and sits there and sits there and sits there. So ideally, um, I put a tray underneath my plant. Mm -hmm. That way I can just lift the whole thing up and dump the extra water out. Yeah. Yeah. And then have gravel below if, in that tray if you wanted to, but gravel becomes a problem. So really the interior trays are best with um, pots with no holes. Okay. How do you know when it's time to repot a string of hearts plant? Mine is in a four inch plastic pot and generating a lot of new growth. Well, when you see that the top of the soil is completely full with plants and you don't see any more soil, that would be the time to transplant because then it starts to crowd out. Um, or you can divide it carefully. Um, but usually they, they fare very well being full. Uh, but if you want them to expand and get bigger, then pot them as soon as you don't see any uh, soil. Okay. Um, next question, person received a large orchid in June, and I'm assuming it's a phalaenopsis, but I'm not sure. Um, it just mm -hmm. dropped almost okay. all of its blooms. What is the next step? Oy vey. <laughs> um, orchids are so persnickety. Some people are so successful with them, others are not. I would say that um, if it dropped all its blooms right away, you might've watered it one day too early. Um, orchids really don't like water and they hate salt. So um, rinse them, don't water them and use bottled water. And they need a really nice source of light like this picture here on the screen. That's the kind of light an orchid needs. They need bright light, but not direct light. But salt and water are orchids nemesis. If you water once and forget it, a month later you water it, you've already lost the plant. If you water it a week too early, you've already lost the plant. They're very tough. Um, the rule of thumb is watering once every two weeks by rinsing. Um, that way you don't get salt buildup. I try to use bottled water and feed it every time you water it. If you lost the blooms right away, it is not your fault. Don't beat <laughs> yourself up. They are difficult little things. 
Okay, next question. I recently got a Monstera wet stick. Do you mm -hmm. know where the aerial roots would form? <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, they don't call them Monstera for nothing because they grow very large roots that like to flow out of the pot and attack all things. If you've <laughs> ever been to Hawaii, you'll see that philodendrons climb all the palm trees. Mm -hmm. They use those roots to climb, and they typically will come out of the top of the pot, right where it kind of joins the soil, and they basically like air. They don't like water, so they're always reaching out of the pot to breathe. That's where you're going to find most of those roots. Some will be, I mean, a lot of them will be underneath, but when they start to run out of space, they go hunting like little monsters. <laughs> Okay, um, the next question, which I think you already talked about, was pet safe plants and resources like the ASPCA toxic. Yeah, and that's, the best, that's the best one. I mean, and I'm sure boxwood is on there, but man, I had no idea. And you will be surprised if you go around your yard um, inside and out, I'll bet you, you'll have a toxic plant there. Um, yeah. Azaleas are toxic. So are ZZ plants. ZZ plants are toxic, yes. And yeah. things that you just, you're like, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is best to go through them. I know a dog that ate the beans, you know, the little uh, pea pods off a of sago and died instantly. I, I mean, it can be that bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that moss and bark are prone to disease. Does that pertain to the moss poles for climbing plants? No, not really, because there's a lot of air space yeah. in those. It's how it holds moisture down to the soil and up against the roots. So, okay. and also that you don't know how moist your soil is because you have moss, it feels dry. Like, oh yeah, it's fine. Yeah, I can water it again, but typically no, you don't want to water it again. Okay. Uh, my mums are getting buds, but not flowering. And if flowering, the flowers are not full. They only open halfway. Mm. What's happening? Mm. Well, are you feeding it? Moms love fertilizer. I know that's kind of a go-to answer for everything, but it really is a go-to answer for everything. Yeah. Um, but also light matters to moms. You know, they can grow in full sun. Um, if they are in full sun and they're doing that, then it might be a nutrient problem. So feed them, feed them, feed them, feed them, feed them, feed them. I have a light meter app. app. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what reading LUX-FC is considered best to be. Wow. Okay. I don't know if I can get that technical. I know. Uh, <laughs> I can look it up and answer later if you want to save me that question from that person or something. Okay. Uh, you know. mm. That's why the guide from the guy is so helpful you know, from that resource I have, where it tells you all the lighting conditions in your house, but um, I don't know exact light lumens for each type of plant. Okay. It might tell you on the plant itself, and then you could figure that out. Um, is it okay to water plants with compost tea? Sure. Indoor plants? Sure, no problem. Okay. Um, somebody said, I am supposed to wipe the leaves of my fiddle leaf fig. Is that true? Um, if so, how often? Well, you know, it's, it's good, especially with large leaf plants um, and plants that carry a lot of dust. It, it helps with uh, the air exchange and the dust uh, collecting on them is um, you know, so a lot of times has toxins in it too. So uh, wiping them down maybe once a month at the most is good. I wouldn't go crazy. Um, my mom always used milk. I thought milk was really cool, um, but it'll leave kind of spots on it. And they have leaf shine products, but leaf shine products, a lot of people just spray them on and, like, and then wipe, but you really want to get the dust off first. So any kind of leaf shine products, great, but wipe the leaves first and then do the leaf shine. But yeah, it's very beneficial to all plants. Obviously you can't, um, you know, 
clean this one off, so rinse it off. Yeah. You can't rinse off big leaves because they leave water spots. So that's where you really need to use the leaf shine is on the larger leaves. Okay, uh, what type of liner for pot would you recommend? I recommend the deeper liner so you don't lose water onto your floor. Um, but if you have an enclosed um, uh, pot with no hole on the bottom, the shorter ones are good. They're just the clear ones. Um, the short ones are, you know, a couple inches, maybe an inch at the most. And then the deeper ones are more like four, three, four. And uh, that's better uh, just, just for protection. Okay. Um, so somebody said that your uh, love plant looked like a silver dollar vine. Uh, no? I don't think so. I don't think okay. that's another common name for it. I'm really sorry I don't have that name. <laughs> I will definitely get it to you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, somebody else mentioned a zero sisios danguyi. Mm hmm <laughs> So I don't know. Um, let's see. What to do with rust disease? I'm not sure do indoor plants rust. Um, not typically, but uh, that's really something you control by sprays. Um, rust is also a condition of just general uh, disease and malady for the plant. So that you would need to do some spraying. Okay. Airflow, you know, same. But rust really isn't really an airflow problem either. So uh, that would be a spray. Okay. Um, I've got a bunch of people that are saying what they think your plant is. So I'm going to bypass those since we don't know for sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, I can pause and look, look it up if you want. And look them up. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. What soil mixes do you recommend for houseplants? Is making your own potting soil better? Um, hmm. uh, well, you know, each type of plant needs a different type of soil. So knowing your plant will direct you on what kind of soil you need to have. I find that pumice and vermiculite added to any soil is hugely beneficial to the plants. Um, things like palms need to grow in almost pure pumice and that's why you have to water them so much. Uh, orchids need bark, no soil. Uh, right. So it's really hard to tell you other than I like to add pumice and vermiculite to my commercial soils. Okay. Um, why is my pathos in water not growing well? It has roots, one leaf grows, and one leaf dies. Sunlight. I would go with sunlight. East facing window, south facing window. Needs more light. And, yeah. and you can put some liquid fertilizer in there. You can definitely feed it when it's in water. Okay. Uh, that would really help both of those things. And next question, can you spray a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water to kill gnat eggs in the soil? I don't know. That's, I, I don't know that answer. Um, Lynn has given, Sorry. that's okay. Lynn has given our Master Gardener helpline. Um, and so maybe that person could go to the Master Gardener helpline and they could Great. research it. Okay. And that uh, holds true for some of the other questions that people have. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so, Adraxinia mas masangina. Adraxinia. Um, one, Dracinia. Dracinia? Yeah, Adraxinia. Corn plant, yes. Uh, they keeps getting a leg ear and the leaves are turning brown. Okay, yep. So um, they say that that plant likes medium light, but I believe it's more of a bright light plant. Um, and the browning is probably lack of water. Anything that browns on the tips is either nutrient or water. 
it's getting leggy for the same reason the other plants get leggy. It is looking for light. And also, uh, one thing I didn't bring up before was that when you have variegated plant material, they will revert to um, solid green if they don't have enough light. So I, I've taken a corn plant, a beautiful, beautiful corn plant in my, um, my living room, all variegated, and within a year it was all green. I was very disappointed, but I forgot that. <laughs> but they get leggy because they don't have enough light and they get brown on the tips because they don't have enough water or nutrients. So feed them, give them more water. And um, those, those tend to like water. So you could easily water that once a week. Um, just make sure it's not sitting in water. Okay. Um... Somebody is asking, and you already answered this, but I want to reiterate. Sure. Softened water is not okay to use on any plants because it contains salt. Correct. And don't salt use it outdoors or indoors. Correct. 100%. Indoors or outdoors. Don't use it if you can not use it. Yeah. Um, how do you categorize light from a solar tube? <laughs> huh. Well, actually, yeah, that I would say that that is bright light to medium light. It just depends on its orientation. So if it's facing south, oh my gosh, it wakes you up in the morning bright. Um, if it's facing east, it's great in the morning. Not so, you know, so it kind of has the same conditions as inside and outside, but um, it can go from bright to medium. It's a great, the solar tubes are great. Okay, is it still safe to use a bag of potting mix that has some small, they've grown some small white mushrooms? It's a new bag, but it's been opened for about a month. Hmm. Well, that means that it's still composting. So if you're getting mushrooms out of your, your soil, that means it is still composting. So no, I wouldn't use that one. I would put that in my yard and go give it to some other plants to use and uh, start over. What would be the signs of too much fertilizer? Burn, leaf burn. Leaf burn? Definitely leaf burn. Yeah, that's first thing. Uh, leaf drop. Um, uh, die back. Those, those three things. Okay. My hibiscus plant gets buds, but before flowering, the buds fall off. What could be the reason the leaves look healthy otherwise? That's not really an indoor plant, is it? No, but it can be. You can grow it in bright light, so okay. I'll, I'll take the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would fertilize that plant. I, it doesn't have enough energy to flower. Um, hibiscus love water. Um, sometimes you might be giving it too much water, like if its feet are wet. Um, hibiscus tend to like good drainage. Uh, if they're in a low-lying area, they will do what you just described. They'll lose their flowers, but their leaves look good. So food, check your water. Um, and they like bright light. They love full sun. Yeah. If you do have it inside, move it outside for a while. Um, but they like full sun, good drainage, and a lot of food. Okay, can I grow a spider plant indoor in low light? Mm, yes, um, but it won't be prolific. It'll just survive. So it's much better in a medium light situation, but you know, they do, they list it as a low light and I have it on here as a low light, but um, you need to rotate it a little bit for it to be happy. Okay. Um, what would you recommend I use to feed my Calathea medallion? Mm. I believe that's an acid loving plant, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, from my recollection. So maybe you could use an orchid mix, you know, type fertilizer. I'm sorry, not orchid, uh, azalea, or um, add some coffee grounds. But you need to look it up because I'm not 100% sure uh, what its needs are, but I believe it likes acid. Okay. Um... 
so about your question about variegated plants, will if they once they turn green, will they can they become variegated again if they're put in the right light? <laughs> Maybe. I don't I don't know that I, don't, I haven't tried that. <laughs> okay. I tried a lot of things. I haven't tried that. Um, <laughs> And I haven't researched that either, but it's a great question. I think um, that's worth experimenting with. Okay. Don't know. Um, what, why do my indoor dumb canes leaves get sticky on the surface? Hmm. And can it probably survive fungus, outdoors? Probably a fungus or maybe a bug that you don't see. Yeah. You know? Um, I have that problem on my plants and it's usually scale or yeah. another yeah, things you don't see that they're leaving this honeydew yep. um, on them especially the black the black ones that you don't see yeah. so uh, spray it needs to be sprayed you know yeah. with an insecticidal soap or a specific spray for that okay what plants do best growing in hydroponic clay pebbles oh <laughs> that's a hmm. new one yeah um, heavy uh, plants that like a lot of water generally you can't do like um, succulents and things like that you, things that are like bog type plants um, you wouldn't do something like snake plant because it's succulent and the water stays in the leaves and and drowns in there um, I don't know a specific plant but you could probably pick some bog plants that would do well And guess what? Huh. We're done. No, I don't want to be done. <laughs> That's the best part of my day. <laughs> That's that, those were some excellent oh, wonderful questions. Wonderful questions. I'm so grateful that people were really interested and got a lot of people on board here. Um, and I hope it was helpful. Um, everybody be sure to um, go to our website. Um, which is ucanner.edu slash sites slash VCMG. And you can look at, um, just explore that website because you can find a lot of answers to questions that we couldn't answer today, or you can go to our Master Gardener helpline. Also on our website, you can um, register for future classes. We have on October 10th, we have a pumpkin succulent class coming up. And on October 15th, uh, Alwyn will be back with creating a shade garden, so. Right, so thank you everyone for, for participating and um, we hope to see you at some of our other classes. And thank you very much, Alwyn. Um, it yes, was yes, wonderful. I'm wonderful. here, sorry. Hello. Um, <laughs> before we leave everybody, there is a question. Somebody's saying they'd love to see a similar session on fall vegetable gardening. Well, we actually have that coming October 29th. Go to our website and uh, sign up for it. Everything is uh, no cost. So um, Lynn, can you type our, can you type that faster than I can? Our website. Um, do you, I can do it. I'll do it. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm going to type our website so everybody can sign up for classes. Here it is. Okay. There's our website for signing up for future classes. So October 29th will be uh, fall and winter vegetable gardening. All right. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.